let's make sure I not use the microphones. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Yep. Yep. Um, so it's really good to be here. Um, I like talking about innovation. It's really fun to talk about. I think especially because the pace is just so fast right now. Um, and that can be pretty hard for us to realize in our day-to-day -day lives. But I had this really awesome moment of clarity last weekend. And I was outside in the front yard. I had two young boys, uh, ages five and two. And so they're trucking around in their power wheels. And it all of a sudden hits me that this may be the only car my kids ever drive. You know, and it's, it's true. I mean, think about it. Um, you know, that, the way the pace is moving with... Um, you know, self-driving vehicles, ride sharing. In 10 years, it's completely feasible that my kids will never have that moment where they get their driver's license, you know, get the car keys for the first time, and they're, you know, scared to death going out on the road and, you know, overcoming that obstacle. And, you know, they're gonna live on a completely different planet <laughs> than I grew up on. And so, yeah, in the innovative world we live in too, it can be intimidating sometimes. I mean, last month, Elon Musk shot his Tesla into space. And I'm sitting there going, well, shit, what have I done this year? <laughs> Much done at all. Um, and, but innovation, I don't think, you know, we should put that much pressure on ourselves with it. Um, because really, you know, you can take very small pieces of the world and change it. And so instead of putting innovation on this pedestal, um, I really think that there are just thousands of sparks around us all the time, you know small ideas that are happening. And it's really incumbent upon us not so much to be great inspirations, but just to you know, have cultures where we don't kill these ideas before they ever get started. Um, so a bit about my background. Um, I started my career as a naval officer, um, did some time in the Navy, and then got out and worked in the med tech area in Fortune 500 companies. And then I was that salmon kind of swimming upstream to smaller and smaller companies, uh, ran p l for private equity, um, growth stage companies and then did a startup turnaround and now I'm doing what I do today and uh, my primary efforts right now are taking two startup companies to market uh, and trying to get them up and stable. Um, and I think innovative ideas, um, I've been really fortunate to work with some pretty innovative teams in my career, doing some really cool innovative stuff. Um, and. I want to tell some of those stories today, not to really brag about these ideas and talk about how world-changing they are, uh, but I want to focus on that exact moment, you know, where the idea comes into play and the spark. And I want to illustrate just how, you know, almost insignificant it can be. Um, and for all these ideas that, you know, make it to market, if they're not killed right out of the gate, you know, usually they have a few near-death experiences along the way. Um, so my hope is um, I'll tell a couple of my stories and maybe we can reflect on our own and you know do a little bit more to get out of the way when it comes to fostering innovation. Um, so my first story I'll tell I was um, was back when I was working for Covidian and I was in a purchasing team and our team was responsible for buying equipment in the operating room. Um, now we had goals every year and our primary goal was to you know achieve some sort of cost savings target. And every year we would get frustrating that the marketing team would kick back all of our ideas saying we couldn't make certain changes. So this year we were very proactive. You know, we got marketing together um, and we wanted to go over the ideas, you know, as a team. So this meeting stretches for about two hours. It starts to draw into the lunch time frame and we start getting into a product called replacement lead wires. Now, you know, there are markets out there for everything, and this is certainly one of those markets you know a lot of people don't know about. But if you're in an operating room, there's a piece of there's a piece, there's a piece of machinery called an operating room monitor, and when they hook you up to it, there's these wires that connect from your electrodes to the machine. Now these machines last 10 years, but the wires do not, so you need to constantly replace the lead wires. And of course, there's a market for that, and there's people that passionately care about that market. Um, so they were really driving us for some more cost savings. Like I said, the meeting's starting to break into lunchtime, and somebody on the team made a smart-ass comment, I won't say who, um, you know, I think the comment was something along the lines like, well, how cheap do you want these things? You know, If you want them for 2 or $3, we can get it for you, they're just going to fall apart in a week. Um, but what we didn't know was that operating room nurses hated cleaning lead wires. And that $2 cheap lead wire idea was a catalyst uh, for an innovation. Um, so... I think it took us about a year and we launched Covidian's first <coughs> disposable lead wire. Um, there had been nothing in our portfolio like it, um, but the nurses loved it. 
Um, if you think about how tedious it is to do infection control in an operating room, you have to clean every one of those tiny lead wires. They love just getting a cheaper one they can use once and throw away uh, when they get new patients. So that product took off. I was not close enough to the sales side to know um, how well it did revenue-wise, but I know the forecast, um, they blew out their initial forecast by about 3x and I had a lot of trouble uh, keeping up with their demand. Um, so when I think about that small moment, you know, what typically kills an idea like that? You know, how does it, you know, never come into play? Well, I think, um, you know, we're focused a lot of here on new companies and small companies, but what I see is as companies grow, the biggest thing that happens is sales and operations split. And that's where you gain your competitor advantage over a larger company. You know, when you think about it, when you're an entrepreneur and your company's small, you're very, very close to, you know, the development, you know, the supply side, the solution side of what you're doing. And you're talking to the customers and all the problems in the marketplace are right in front of you. So you're very quick to adapt to that. You know, you're very quick to, you know, have innovative ideas that get in the marketplace. But if your company grows, watch out. Because your sales team eventually separates from operations. And now all of that feedback from the customer goes to the top and it has to come back down and it gets extremely filtered. And that's where I see a lot of big companies losing competitive advantages <coughs> and why most innovative companies are small. You know, they get into a marketplace and they react quickly. And I think another killer is mandated initiatives. Um, so, and, and small companies can get in this trap too. As you get a small team, it's very tempting to tell your team how to do things. You know how to paint by numbers and go you know about getting something done but i always find it's much better if you give your team just a generic big target um, like move the needle on this number from here to here by the end of the year and then make them come up with the ideas you can of course plant a few initiatives but don't close it up leave it open-ended so people come up with more ideas they'll come up with better ideas than you do in the long run so my next story um i gotta move quick because i think i'm right on 30 minutes uh, uh with this but um I was uh, CEO for O2 Concepts, and uh, O2 Concepts is a company, um, if you've ever had a relative or maybe seen someone that walks around with a portable oxygen bottle, um, if you have COPD, which is emphysema or chronic bronchitis, you will eventually need oxygen to kind of maintain your day to day. So portable oxygen machines are pretty neat pieces of equipment. Um, they actually take atmosphere, they scrub out nitrogen, and they give you medical grade 90% pure O2. And they can run on batteries, you can take them on airplanes, you can take them overnight places, and it's really life-changing for the patients. So O2 Concepts have gotten into this industry. We were by no means the first into market. I think we were the fifth or sixth player uh, to actually get to market. Um, and I was brought in in a turnaround effort. The company had got into the market, got some initial traction, and then bigger competitors were starting to squeeze us out, like Philips and Indicare. Um, so we really focused on the quality of our product. Um, what we had that no one else had was we had a virtually bulletproof product that worked really, really well. Um, and we really focused on our quality. And through some pricing and warranty strategies, we were actually <coughs> starting to get traction. But we were extremely relentless with quality. You know, we met every week on it. And so our weekly meeting was we would sit there and we would look at every single machine that got returned, every call we got, every complaint. And we wanted to put in a root cause solution to that issue so it never happened again. So in the course of the next few years, our product would get more and more bulletproof and less costly to maintain and repair. So we're in one of these meetings, and we notice that about half the product that comes back, we actually fix it with a software upgrade. So we're paying money to ship this product all the way back to our facility, you know, load the latest software update, and it goes right back to the customer. We're paying all that freight. And then our lead, Stacey, says, well, why don't we just put a cell phone on these damn things so we don't have to upload the software anymore? Why not, right? We just put a cell phone on it. That's easy to do. Um, so let me put that comment into context a little more and tell you a little bit more about Stacy. So Stacy had come to, off the street uh, with a resume, knocked on our door, looking for work. Um, she had come from the construction industry, and she had great timing because we were starting to grow, we were in need of warm bodies, and we put her on the production line, I think, the next day. Um, and what we quickly learned about Stacy is that she was very passionate about getting her job done. In fact, if you impeded her progress in any day, you were going to have a really bad day. You know, Whether you were a line worker or the manager, I mean, God have mercy on you if you got in Stacy's way and, and kept her from getting her job done. So um, we like Stacy a lot. And I think it took us all of three months to promote her to the lead position, which is probably two months too late. Um, and then so Stacy in the meeting says, why don't we just put a cell phone on the damn things? And so 
of course, I'm winding up to crush this idea because we got other things to move on to. Putting a cell phone on a product is very hard to do. Uh, we don't have time. We have other things to focus on. And then my lead engineer pipes up and says, well, that would be probably pretty costly and it would add a lot of cost to our product. So I'm like, right? There's the voice of reason right there. you know." And then we had another person on our team, a software engineer, who was a contractor. And he had worked with a solar company and told us, listen, guys, this is not nearly as expensive as you think. We just did this project with a solar company um, and the cost has really come down. And if you actually contact Verizon directly, they have a ton of resources to throw at this. So I stopped mid wind up and now I can't hear enough about putting a cell phone on our product right now. That's all I want to talk about for the rest of the meeting. So it took us about nine months and we launched our DNA platform, Dynamic Network Analysis to the market. Um, and we were the first in the portable oxygen industry to connect our devices with fleet monitoring. So the way our product worked is we sold it to a customer who rented this to patients through Medicare. And so they would have to rent this product and recover it. Um, and we were actually the first platform that allowed people to actually monitor their patients for usage uh, to see if they were using the device and staying healthy. Uh, we can be very proactive on maintenance and see if they were having issues before they actually failed and stranded a patient. And, you know, when patients passed away or they moved, our customers could go out and recover devices very quickly. Oh, and by the way, it also uploaded software. You can see how far we took the idea, you know, when it was all said and done. But, and when we were out in the marketplace, of course, I'm acting all visionary about it. You know, we're having press meetings and um, talking about um, how we intended to do this all along. But really, I mean, it was just Stacy saying, put a damn cell phone on it. It's that easy. So um, I think when it comes to ideas like this, um, there are a few killers. Um, and, and the one that may not be obvious, I think, is industry experience. Um, as companies grow, they tend to get really proud of their industry experience sometimes. They only hire uh, from within their industry. And that could be a very common, you know, I think sometimes lazy thing to do with HR and filtering. Um, don't do that. As you grow, that will kill you. Uh, you need some cross-pollination on your team. So we never launch this idea, you know, if we don't have a construction-minded person like Stacy that's, you know, not afraid to tell her boss to put a cell phone on it. And we don't have this idea, we don't have someone on the team that's worked in the solar industry. Because medical devices at the time, we weren't connecting a lot of stuff. We were very hesitant because patients and patient privacy. Um, but, you know, the solar industry and other industries, they were doing this much more quickly. So that actually saved us. So that's something I would advise as your teams build, you know, make sure you have good experience from other industries. Um, and the other one that saved this is, God, I just shut my mouth magically for like 10 minutes, you know. If I had stepped on that idea as the boss and leveled an opinion that was the opposite of it, there probably wouldn't have been any follow-on conversation. Um, so that's something to keep in mind too. You know, when your team's talking things out, Save your opinion for the end. Just see where it goes. Um, you'll be surprised sometimes. All right, two more companies I want to talk about. These are very much more entrepreneur related. Um, so this company I got involved with is a company called iJuice. Um, it was an interesting play. Um, what they were trying to do was they were trying to take your average common public outlet and they were putting an IoT enabled plate on it, you know, very low cost that would connect to the internet. And what that would allow you to do, say if you're one of those patients with an oxygen machine, or if you have a powered wheelchair, it's very critical that you can find power and have access to it, or you're very tethered. You have to go out and come back home before your battery dies. Um, so this opportunity allowed people to actually find and reserve outlets. And we, of course, thought we could expand that business model to business travelers, anyone with a laptop, really anyone with a cell phone that was traveling and stranded on a plane. Um, but, you know, the company, we, I got on board and we started a crowdfunding and it didn't really have a great response. Um, no one was really over the moon about it. Um, so I have very high opinions on the crowdfunding itself, the brand imagery, and everything that was going on. So since I opened my big mouth, I was asked to get more involved in the second round of the fundraising. So I did, and we were doing all the right things. We brought in a good marketing firm, Echo Factory. Uh, we were rebranding everything, we were revamping the story, and it was great. Uh, but the more we just dug into the marketplace and did the research, we still weren't resonating. Um, for investors, the numbers just weren't stacking up. We, we didn't have enough people willing to pay for it, and it was very incredibly costly to scale and you know get everything out there to a level we need to to make this actually this idea fly. So we were at one of those moments where we were getting a lot of pushback on the very core of what we were trying to do. 
Um, and it's that moment where we're really trying to find a good pivot um, or do we just push forward and ignore the advice we're getting and see if the market says something different? And that's tempting to do because you put a lot of emphasis into it. Um, what we did, we did pivot. So uh, what we eventually did is we rebranded the company entirely to Power Hero. And we are now coming to the market with a, I think is a pretty powerful, comprehensive peer-to-peer -peer sharing platform for electric vehicle charging. So what this allowed us to do is we didn't really change any of the development we were doing you know, all of these software, the platform, the hardware was basically, you know, the same concept, but we just retooled to a different market in electric vehicles. So our goal with Power Hero is we want to grow the power grid faster than we can with infrastructure. And what we want to tap into is people with private charging stations willing to join a peer-to-peer -peer network so they can have access to more charging stations. Because there are only 17,000 public stations right now for electric vehicles and about half a million uh, private stations out there that can be shared. Um, we can do very simple things like I talked about with putting a, you know, taking a plug, listing it next to a parking spot so apartment dwellers that have no access to overnight charging can find spaces to park in and lease them overnight. And eventually we want to roll out that kind of hardware so we can connect any power terminal, whether it be a 110 volt outlet, uh, 240 volt, or you know, take any basic level two charger and connect that. So then people will be able to do the whole concept where you book it, reserve it, um, and you know you can list it, price it dynamically, and actually charge the transactions on our platform. Um, so that's Power Hero, and our goal is you know we've got to put at least a million chargers in the marketplace in order for the electric vehicle market to really thrive, and we want to be the first one to hit that number. And so what I think is when you get to a moment to pivot, um, what I really liked about you know what our team did is we embraced the failure early. Um, you know we didn't get out in the market again and let the market tell us, you know, we were getting um, good advice, you know, then, you know, some pushback and we really embrace that instead of forcing it. Um, and a lot of time people don't want to embrace that failure. That's really, really hard to do, um, especially when you put your heart and soul into something. Um, and inflexibility. Um, a lot of time you just get kind of caught up on the core of the idea, you know, which, you know, I'm involved, my passion is helping patients, but I really had to sacrifice that you know, to make this idea fly, to find the right market for it. Not that you can't come back to that, but I think you need a high degree of flexibility when you're trying to get a good idea in the marketplace to make sure you find the right one and let it resonate. So my last story, I'll tell you about uh, my friend and partner. His name's John. Um, he's a, here at Boca Pasadena. And um, so John Chi is a Stanford graduate. Um, so this is, I'm telling the story now. So he graduated Stanford, electrical engineer, and he gets involved as lead you know, tech developer for a few startups. And so after that, John just gets a bug about stem cells. You know, his dad has bad hips, he's researching stem cell technology, and he decides this is what he wants to do. So John goes out and puts himself through a biotech graduate program, right? Who doesn't? It's just who to do for John. Um, puts himself through a biotech graduate program, and along the way, he meets a couple of friends and they get really excited about a new business idea. You know, they're gonna have, you know, a new stem cell startup. And, you know, someday it's really gonna be great. You know, this, this is really what we're gonna do. But like a lot of ideas like this, um, it becomes something you talk about a lot, but no one ever really picks up the ball on it. You know, you never take those major first steps. You know, it's something you just, you know, you have a couple of beers and it's fun to talk about the market and the huge potential. But nothing ever really happens. So I think it's the last semester of the program, and John gets a jury summons, and he's pissed off like all of us. So he goes to jury duty and um, takes his laptop with him, and he says, all right, I'm at least going to make something of this day. I'm going to buckle down, and I'm going to figure out this stem cell company and what it's going to be. So John gets six hours of uninterrupted work time, you know, going after this, doing market research, you know, rolling out an outline for a business plan, doing some initial pro formas, and he comes back to his team and everyone's pumped. Um, a few weeks later, they enter a business plan competition and they win. You know, so now they got some momentum. Now he's got a check, starts prototyping, starts raising a little more money, uh, wins another business plan competition, and everything starts to cascade from there. Um, two years ago, John founded Sonova Life Sciences. I'm proud to be a part of that company. Um, and today, John is sitting on what I think is one of the most significant breakthroughs in stem cell harvesting. Um, so if you don't know much about the stem cell industry and what it's doing in medicine, um, it's quite fascinating right now. So 
they're actually able to take your fat tissue out and separate your own stem cells and put them back into your body to fix you. And they're treating everything from cancer to Parkinson's to heart failure. And more commonly, a lot of people and athletes are using this to treat joint problems, um, whether it be arthritis or recovering from surgery faster. Um, so John's machine is quite a breakthrough. Um, normally it takes about an hour and a half in chemicals to get stem cells out of your fat. Um, our technology gets them out in 90 seconds versus 90 minutes and gets twice the number of stem cells. Um, it's also the only completely disposable um, system on the market. So it's one button automation and you have no cleaning and you can throw everything away. But John will tell you, despite all the traction he's made, um, everything he did um, and where the company is today, if it wasn't for that jury summons, this company doesn't exist. You know, he doesn't make the breakthrough he does today because procrastination was killing it. They would have never gotten it done. There was a semester left. Enough of the team members would have gotten different opportunities and jobs and they never would have made it happen. So I ended on this one because I think procrastination is the number one murderer of innovative ideas. You know, we all have one, um, but we all have other stuff to do um, that makes it very hard to get it done. So. The one challenge I'll give you um, is if you have one of those innovative ideas, whether it be a new business, um, some charity you want to do, um, some new aspect of your business you want to open up, this morning, book yourself a one-hour calendar event with just you. Not in your office, not by your phone. A one-hour calendar event with just you and put pen to paper. Who do you want to talk to more about it? What do you need to research? Uh, what are some of the brainstorming ideas you want to put down? And before that meeting ends, make yourself another one hour meeting to do the next thing on it. Because the early momentum is the hardest, but once it gets going, I mean, that's the nature of what we do as entrepreneurs. We gotta be our own engine. So um, don't let the day-to-day -day distract you and kill it. Don't procrastinate. Just keep yourself honest. Use your calendar to do it. So doing this was fun for me because I got to reflect on things I'm good and bad at. Uh, so the things I think I've done well personally uh, in my career is um, I've had the good forums where people, we don't have report out meetings with my teams. It's typically a meeting on some measurable item that the market cares about. And then we have a team that's able to talk about our existing solutions we're trying to get in place and come up with new solutions. I think as you grow, that's where the magic happens. You know, you start to get that team five or 10 people. You can't tell them to paint by numbers. You have to have these kind of formats uh, to keep innovation moving. Um, I've been pretty decent at not procrastinating and keeping myself honest with the calendar. Um, and the other thing that um, I'm pretty relentless about with my teams is that there are no barriers. Um, so when you think about it, you're sitting there trying to problem solve. Most people put their own barriers in their head when it comes to putting solutions on the table. And what I mean by that is they'll have an idea, but they think it's too expensive or you don't have enough resources on it. My theme is if the laws of science in our courts allow it. I want it on the table. You know, if it's possible and it keeps me out of jail, put it on the table. You know, you may have an idea that you think is too expensive, and somebody who hasn't thought of it knows how to make it cheaper. Um, so, so really get your teams to think that way, and don't let them, you know, kind of suppress their own ideas. Um, things I need to work on. I talk too much in meetings. Um, I have high opinions, and I just need to shut up sometimes. You know, ask more questions, get my team to facilitate and you know, talk about things a little bit more. Um, I can get too attached to ideas. Um, I get really excited about them and emotional, and I, you know, can have a hard time being flexible when it comes to pivoting. Um, so, something else I need to work on. And um, I don't embrace failure well enough. You know, I don't like to hear the bad news. I don't like to hear the naysayer on my ideas. So, I rely on a couple of close friends that just aren't afraid to kick me in the teeth when it comes to things and really tell me how dumb my ideas. And I think that's important. You know, you need that early input uh, because I just think it's rare that you can ever get an idea to market um, the way you originally crafted it in your head. Um, typically, you're going to have to do some major adjustment, if not a few major adjustments, to get it there. So, go find that failure and embrace it. You know, and find that person to tell you the bad news. And if you really need it, help buy me a beer, and I'll tell you. You know, how bad your idea is going to. But, um, <laughs> but thank you. Um, that's it. Um, I appreciate you guys letting me talk. Um, I think I hit the 30 minute point, but if you guys have any questions, I'd be happy to answer.
Thanks, Rob, for sharing your perspective on innovation. Really great, clear examples, um, and uh, we really appreciate that. It seems like every stage there was something that was to be learned and implemented beyond your own thinking, and uh, I think that's really awesome, just opening up the possibility of soliciting advice uh, from people that might not even, you aren't, aren't even qualified to do so. I mean, it's just, you never know where your next great idea or solution to a residual problem will come from. So that's really awesome, and I think we can all learn from that. We're gonna open up to questions now, uh, Q&A. If you have a question, please raise your hand. John walking around with the mic. If whatever is coming out of your mouth does not end with a question mark, it's probably a story or a comment. We will share that and save that for offline. Uh, will you be hanging out with us for a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so if you guys have you know stories about uh, innovation and whatnot, please share that for later. Questions now, thanks. Hi, I, I run a startup and last summer we participated in a pitch event and one of the judges was like, well, you should be doing this. And I sat there thinking, you're so dumb. That's, that's ridiculous. January of this year started percolating on some things and I thought of this great idea and then I realized, oh, that was what the judge told me last summer. So I have two fears right now. One is that I'm just, because I hear a lot of you should do this all day long and I'm having a hard time figuring out which is the valid one and which is the one that six months later I'm going to say duh and I'm also a little bit afraid of shiny object syndrome uh -huh. because yeah. I was at a conference last month and one of the sessions was about something that could have involved our product and I started thinking yes that's the direction we need to be going and then I got back and I was talking to my team and as we were talking it out it became very clear that would be a complete distraction from what we do. So how do you gauge which innovation is the right direction and how much does timing factor into it? Um, well, the first part of it, how do you gauge? Um, it's hard, really. I mean, a lot of situations are very different, but I've always been a fan of, you know, um, in God we trust, all others bring data. So the more data, you know, the better. Um, so one or two opinions isn't great, but if all 10 people are telling you the same thing, then maybe it's valid. Um, so, so try not to react emotionally to it um, when it's just one person, but go verify that uh, with more and more people. And if you can, you, you have access to your appointment, you can't do surveys. I'd encourage you to do that and just test your market as much as you can, as cheaply as you can, without you know, going, painting yourself into a corner where you can't pivot. Um, and timing is everything, right? I mean, you know, it's, you gotta get to the market, you know, in time. And I, I've been involved with too many companies that missed the window. You know, and we were just thinking about it too long, and then, you know, an O2 concept was a great example. We hit the market the same time Philips did with their device. So we were going against the sales force of, you know, thousands of people with our five, you know, and regardless of how great our device was, we just couldn't get in front of that many people. It was very hard to do. Um, so, so timing works. So, you know, what I always encourage people to do is keep moving, right? Move in a way where you can stay flexible, but there'll be a time where you <coughs> go through a gate and there's a major decision where you have to make a commitment. Um, and that's just, I mean, that's where it's make or break, you know. Having enough info, um, the right people you trust, good advisors are extremely important, not just anyone, because someone made a lot of money on another deal doesn't mean they're <laughs> smart. Um, they could have been just extremely lucky. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, getting good advisors, I think, is everything with that. Um, and just keep moving. Can I hear Ross? Yeah. Hi. Um, one of the pointers that you had there was don't get too attached. You know, it could be an idea or a product. Um, are there like main, like three main principles that you have about, you know what, it's time to let this go? Like, are there any things that you can convey to the entrepreneurs out here? Because I think one of the things that makes an entrepreneur great is is being flexible, but also being inflexible. But sometimes I think we get in our own lane, maybe taking something too far when you should have let go, you know, months ago. Um, is there anything you can tell us about, like, you know, three big principles that you can say, hey, you know what, it's time to let us go? Huh. Um, interesting. I probably could. I just wonder if I can do it enough time here. Um, but yeah, you're you're right. It's it's a tough one. I mean, um, it's there, there's always a story about how there's this company that everyone said no to, and they just persisted and persisted and made it. Um, and it's easy to latch onto that and think that's me, but. I can guarantee you there's a thousand other stories where people persisted and persisted and didn't make it um, and lost money. So, um, 
what what I always try to just feel is, you know, there's a core of what you do. You know, there, there's a core behind the idea. And know what that core is. And don't pretend your core is too much more than that. Um, you know, so if you want to do this, um, don't really get too focused on um, all other aspects of your idea being the only way to do it. Um, that's what I say about flexibility. Um, and I think in the end, you know, to get your idea to market, um, you're going to have to bring in money. Um, so, you know, the performa will tell you a lot. You need a performa that is well vetted out and works well. I mean, so, so my big things are, you know, if I'm passionate about it and, you know, there is a way to make the business model work with the numbers, um, go forward with it. But I think that's where you need to get probably most flexible is, you know, looking at different type of business models, looking for ways to make it work. Uh, can you do just a user-based play? and you know, get advertising later. You know, those are all the questions you gotta ask is how do I return someone's money? Because I need someone else to have faith in my idea and not just me. I'm all in, right? You know, you're already all in on it. Uh, but somebody else has to be too, and you have to be you know, pretty, um, you have to be pretty good about that and taking care of those kind of people as well because they're putting their own money into the deal and you know, they wanna be taken care of. They wanna know that you're doing that. Um, so, so I don't know if I have three, but I would just say that you know, just just know what your core is and don't get too married to the things that aren't your core. Um, there's a lot of way to solve problems with the innovative idea or aspect that you have and just be a little more open to those. Next question. Uh, you mentioned that uh, with your iJuice pro, uh, product that you work with uh, Echo Factory. Correct. Uh, is Mike Schaefer here? Um, no. He's out of town. He's out of town. Okay. Um, they're from out of town. So uh, just want to give a shout out to uh, Andy Wilson, who's in the back here. He's the uh, founder of Friday Coffee Meetup and also on the city council of uh, Pasadena. And uh, we kindly refer to him as the father of uh, Friday Coffee Meetup. And, and if he had a son, I would say maybe Mike Schaefer would <laughs> refer, refer to him. And, and Mike is the uh, founder of Echo Factory, as uh, a lot of you may not know. Uh, so actually my question is, um, when, I think it was a great idea when you pivoted from iJuice to Power Hero to go to a peer-to-peer network. Mm -hmm. um, the, how instrumental was their research, market research, in helping you make that uh, uh, determination with that business model? Very. Um, it, it, was, it was very good to see not just data, whether people like it or not, but you really have to read into data to see if people will pay for it. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not so much just survey, you know, data you're looking at. It's the interview questions, the way people answer open-ended questions. And you know, what we saw is everyone was either lukewarm to it, or if they liked it, they were adamant that they didn't want to pay for it. You know, they expect this kind of service to be free. Um, and so that was very telling for us. Um, and it wasn't only the data; it was how people were answering the questions. But I think market research is key, and it's one of the really early things we commissioned them for in this project. Is so. You know, we can go out to a select group of people and see if it hit or not. You know, because we didn't want to experiment with that by going into the market first. And then a follow-up question. I'll give someone else a chance. Hey, Rob. Thanks for a great talk. How fast are you seeing med tech uh, projects? You know, from inception to oh, they evaluate the idea and kill it off because it's not working. Do you see a trend? Um, so you're talking about, you know, early stage ideas and whether they work or not. Well, I've always found that there's kind of a six month point where you have an idea or something you have that's working and you really prove out if it's feasible or not. Um, because in the med tech world, um, it's not so much a customer's opinion, but you got to get a clinical result. Um, if you can get that or there's other some devices getting a clinical result and you can get it better. Really, that's, that's a bench drill. It's not a lot of marketing opinion. If you can get that done in six months, um, then you keep prototyping, you keep pumping money into it, and you figure it out. But that feasibility point is where you kind of make or break, and you either can do it or you can't. Um, but it's all mechanical, so it's very easy. So I think, yeah, short answer is six months in medical devices. Hey, Rob. Thanks so much for a great talk. I wanted to go back to when you talked about um, what you did at O2 Concepts where you really took the advice of the people in that room that allowed you guys to pivot. You know, those decisions to put those people in that room came maybe months before, maybe years before, mm -hmm. to have a solar contractor guy in there, to have somebody who worked construction. Can you talk a little bit about more about forming that team and what you looked for in those people? Because that key point where you sat down and let them talk really, really was the pivot you guys needed. 
Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, as, you're, as the company gets larger, you start to get stakeholders in different parts of the business. So we were talking about repairing and fixing product. So I wanted the lead who was on the line, who made the product that eventually broke to understand what was going on. Um, and then to understand that, okay, there may be things she can help prevent on the line and she had that level of expertise. Uh, we had the final test operator in lead, right. you know, that tested all the products that went out. So really everyone who touched and could affect that process um, not, not to have the team be too big, but enough spokespeople where, you know, every aspect of the business that touched that process that can make it better, we had in that room. And that was our simple principle. Um, and that's the way most of our meetings went. If we were going over another metric, we were the stakeholders who could really affect that. And that was our decision making. So the software programmer who was actually a contractor, we were dealing with a lot of software issues and that's why they were there. So that really just dictated it right there. Who owned it? Uh, one last question. Um, how difficult was it to transfer from a med tech industry into some something like a uh, IG Square? I'm not sure what the two had in common, but I guess uh, you know manager is a manager, and you know if you can uh, run an operation, you can certainly you know find the right people to to do the uh, that are qualified to do the work that you need done. Okay. Um, so far, so good. Um, I may have a different answer for that um, in a few months, but uh, but yeah, I got into it. It was a medical device play and. Uh, was really instrumental in the pivot to electric vehicles. And so um, the good thing that's core for me is that the technology side of it, um, you know, a lot of this stuff is very similar. I had just been in a company where we did an IoT play. We were doing it with, uh, you know, hardware. We were working with a company like Verizon. Um, so the supply side of it is very similar. Um, you know, the demand side of market stuff is very new to me and I'm learning a lot right now.